everybody. So if I can get everybody to stand, please. Uh, we'll begin. Greet somebody. I know we're kind of spread out. But yeah, there you go. Just wave across the room. There you go. That works.
Thank you all for being here today. We're glad you're here, whether you're joining us in person or you're joining us online. I uh, do want to say a special thanks to Dan, who is uh, playing on piano for us. Not Billy him, just here playing piano. And uh, Mike Sheets is back there on the boards. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in the announcements, but just want to say thank you to them before I forget. And let's open with a word of prayer. Uh, gracious God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to worship today. God, we thank you uh, for those that have come and those that are joining us online. We pray your blessing upon those who are with us today. God, we pray that you would send down your Holy Spirit in this place right now. God, that you would open every heart and every mind to your presence and to your word, uh, to one another. That we, God, you would receive our prayers and praise today. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Oh, you may be seated. And now with joy and thanksgiving, let us offer to God the gifts that we have brought.
uh, whether uh, you were a part of the staff, the volunteers, the kitchen staff, whether you sent kids, grandkids. Um, it was a wonderful week. If you went to the performance last night, it was absolutely fabulous. Um, it was a wonderful job. And thank you, Dan. You're back here somewhere. Thank you, Dan, for, <laughs> for leading that. It was his first time uh, leading a full-scale music camp. And so we had Jessica the first time leading BBS, and Dan the first time leading a full-scale music camp. And um, and we only had one casualty, which had nothing to do with any of that. So, um, and, and that brings me to an update on Jim. Many of you have heard, know that uh, uh, Jim experienced a severe health crisis on Thursday morning. Um, and uh, when, when there were a lot of updates that came out of the prayer chain, so if you've been part of that, you know that, but I'm, I'm gonna summarize that. I was uh, at the hospital uh, yesterday afternoon. He's in, he's in at Trinity in Rock Island. I was going down the room to his, uh, going down the hall to his room, and he met me in the hallway on a walker with two two therapists walking with him. But he was up and walking, and and eating and talking and being ornery. Uh, so uh, praise God for, for that healing. I, I think it's a, I think God gets all the credit for that because uh, Jim was not in a good place on Thursday morning. So. Um, Continued prayers, but phrases also uh, for that healing. Um, and before before Jim took ill, uh, we do have some bonus footage, just a little bit of bonus footage from, from BBS uh, that we didn't get to incorporate in our uh, show last time. Exercise for the staff. So, uh, here we go. Our scripture reading for this morning uh, comes from Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, through chapter 2, verse 5. Listen to the word of God. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, as I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those in Laodicea, and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mysteries of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. The Word of God. For the people of God. Thank you, God. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we are continuing our series in the book of Colossians called In Christ Alone, uh, which will take us through. Uh, the end of August. Uh, by the way, uh, mark your calendars for August 20th. I think it's August 28th, the last Sunday in August. Um, we will, uh, is the sermon there, Mike? The sermon's August? Okay, kind of a brown background. Ah, yeah, and I just need the first one. So, um, 
So we're, we're in our sermon series called In Christ Alone. And uh, through the end of August, what was I? At the end of August, uh, we have our kickoff Sunday, which will be the last Sunday in August. Uh, we'll have a single service at, uh, at 10, at least to be at 10, and then lunch, and then some activities, out, some outdoor activities if we have good weather. Um, there'll be details about that coming, but I want to get that on your radar for the end of August. Um, so we're in this series called In Christ Alone, and we're talking about our theme is the sufficiency and the supremacy of Christ. That Christ is enough. Christ is enough. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And of course, uh, this is in contradiction, Paul's writing, to the, to the heresies that emerged in the Colossian church, which were basically Christ and. Christ and something else. Uh, for salvation. And he's not really even dug into the actual heresies yet. Um, he's still kind of building his base. Uh, for, this, uh, for this last bit of chapter 1 and this first bit of chapter 2, I'm going to take the passage apart and skip around a bit uh, to make a point. Uh, that point is about maturity. Paul says that his goal for believers is for us to be mature. In chapter 1, verse 28, he says his, his desire for us is to be mature in Christ. Uh, and, and we need to define maturity, and we can define it in different ways. Uh, biologically speaking, uh, human be uh, biologically speaking, an organism is mature, is mature, has reached adulthood uh, when it is capable of producing offspring. Now, Let's agree that that's a very poor standard for human maturity. <laughs> the capability to produce offspring does not make one mature. I can give you examples, but I won't. Uh -huh. So, so they go beyond. So, like we hit this magic number eighteen, right? And we're supposed to be mature. Uh -huh. and, and I found that 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 this this phase of life that I'm in now, this parenting of young adults. Yeah, this stinks. <laughs> this stinks. Can I get an amen? Amen. Parents and young adults who have been through it, right? It, it is. It is. It is. It is difficult. Um, and because we're still working on maturity, right? Uh, we have independence, but we don't always have maturity. Of course, we we also talk about emotional maturity, and I would define emotional maturity uh, loosely as. The ability to live with not getting what you want all the time. You can you can nuance that, you can expand that in various ways, but it, it's just the, the ability to not respond, the ability to control your emotions and not respond emotionally to every situation, and the ability to not need to have what you want all the time. But of course, what we're talking about here is spiritual maturity, and the Greek word here is uh, teleos. Which means finished, complete, or even perfect. But understand that the Greek word uh, perfect does, does not necessarily mean what the English word perfect means. In English, the word perfect means uh, cannot be improved upon. Cannot be improved upon. That's what the word, word English word perfect would mean. It's just you can't do anything else to it. Um, whereas in, in Greek, the, the, the connotation of teleos is something that does its job, something that fulfills its purpose, uh, but could still be improved upon. Um, there were some things, you know, obviously there's some things that can't be improved upon, but, but for spiritual maturity is you're there, but you continue to grow. Teleos means you're there, but you continue to grow. And that's, that's hard for us to get our minds around. But it's really not so much because I illustrate that with the children. Uh, we have we have adults, we have young adults who are adults, but they're still growing, and we even have older adults that are still growing. And I found, especially in the spiritual realm, that 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 I have found people who are younger than me chronologically who are more mature than me spiritually. And I have found people who are older than me chronologically who are not as mature as me spiritually, and you've experienced that as well. But I want to unpack. What, what it means to be spiritually mature, according to these verses. Uh, mature believers have knowledge and wisdom of the gospel. 
the mystery of Christ. Mature believers have knowledge and wisdom of the gospel, the mystery of Christ. Now, I put knowledge and wisdom because, of course, we all know that knowledge and wisdom are different things. Uh, uh, knowledge, for instance, is knowing that a uh, tomato is a fruit. Uh, wisdom is not trying to put it in a fruit salad. And, of course, philosophy is debating whether or not that makes ketchup a smoothie. Uh, but, but this idea of mystery, this idea of knowledge, wisdom, mystery, this, this, this is kind of woven through this passage. And I, I unpacked some of that in the Wesley Word. I hope you read it. I worked hard on it. Um, but, but what Paul is uh, refuting here, or beginning to refute, uh, is a kind of a infant version, kind of a pre uh, Gnosticism, a heresy called Gnosticism. This is a very early beginning version of it. Gnosticism from the Greek word to know. Um, and basically, they were putting forth the idea that there was some kind of secret knowledge. There was some kind of secret knowledge. And it, it wasn't, you couldn't find it in the Bible. Instead, you had to, you know, you had to look inside yourself and you had to stare at your table uh, uh, until suddenly you realized this, this big secret knowledge uh, that nobody else knew, only a few people knew. And in fact, it got so bad in the second century that there were, there were uh, churches or groups of people in churches who said, well, you know, our pastor really doesn't know the secret. You know, we will get together in a circle of coffee and we'll whisper because our, we know the secret. We know the real truth. Our pastor doesn't even know the real truth. It got bad, man. And what was this big secret? Well, basically, the big secret was um, the idea that the body is bad, the body is evil, and that we are, in fact, spirits trapped in bodies. We're spirits trapped in bodies. There's something wrong with our bodies. Our spirits are the real us. Our body doesn't really line up with who the real us really is. And so we, we have to, we have to, and, and the idea was transcendence. Um, and if the body is bad, what does that mean about Jesus? That means Jesus couldn't have had a body because bodies are bad. And so they denied the incarnation. And so now you see where we've ended up off the rails. And so it's it's this it's this combating of this idea of mystery and secrets and wisdom and knowledge that Paul is going up against. Um, and you know, I'll have to I'll have to confess that that um, you know, when I was first working on becoming a pastor, um, you know, I thought, and had this vague idea in the back of my head, you know how you get these silly ideas in the back of your head? I, I thought that one day, somebody was gonna, somebody, as I was going through the candidacy process, somebody while I was going through seminary, sometime, somebody would, would kind of take me in the back room and kind of tell me all the secrets. Or, 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 you know, at least you teach me the secret handshake, right? We met this pastor should at least have a secret handshake, don't you think? Um, but, but, but that never happened. That never happened. And so here, here's the thing. I can tell you, after 20 years of pastoral ministry, and a few years of lay ministry before that, I can tell you that the secret is that there is no secret. The secret is that there is no secret. I do not have access to information that you do not have access to. I am not smarter than you. I know you don't want to hear that. I'm not smarter than you. I don't have access to information you don't have. Even this Greek stuff I don't want to show off. I can show you the tools I use for that. It's all online. Right? You can do what I do if you spend the time I spend. Right? I, I am not, I am not special in that regard. It's not about, that's what Paul's trying to get at. There's, there's nothing hidden from Paul. Paul isn't holding anything back. Paul has shared everything that he has to share. The Bible has everything in it that, that we need. 
that's the sufficiency of Scripture. We have the sufficiency of Christ. We also have the sufficiency of Scripture. That everything we need to know is in the Bible right there in front of us for either me or, in fact, any of you to know. Well, because we are, uh, because we have good knowledge and wisdom, mature believers are not deceived by fine-sounding arguments. Mature believers are not deceived by fine-sounding arguments. Paul says that in chapter 2, verse 4. The Greek word here translated as deceive, I'm going to show off again, y'all ready? Um, again, this is all online, I ain't special. Um, is paralogizomai, right? That's easy for me to say. That's, that's, that's why I do it. I spent a lot of money learning how to do this stuff, and a lot of time, I'm going to use it. Uh, paralogizomai, para, para, alongside of, Paralegal, paramedic, parallel, para alongside, or even instead of, or even its most negative term, false. Right? Um, not what we mean when we talk about paraprofessional type people, but in its most negative term, it can mean false. Logizomai is an accounting term. It's it means to keep books. It's based on the word logic. And so to have a to logizomai the log. The logizomai is to keep a set of books. To paralogizomai, that is to keep a second set of books. A set of books alongside. So it has the notation of fraud, right? That's what it means, fraud. Deception. Cooking the books. And there's people who will do that and try to deceive us. But if we're mature believers, if we're based in knowledge and wisdom, then the mystery, that the secret is Jesus Christ, then that's the gospel, that we know everything there is to know contained between the covers of the Bible about Jesus. Everything there is to know about Jesus is in the Bible. Everything there is to know about Jesus is in the Bible. And if we know that, then we won't be deceived. Because we have wisdom, because we have knowledge, and because we are not able to be deceived, mature believers then have stability, discipline, and firm faith in Christ. Mature believers have stability, discipline, and firm faith in Christ. Paul says that in our closing verse 2 5. And to me, that's one of the markers that I, that I look for, particularly when I'm looking for people in leadership. I'm looking for people who have, who have, who practice spiritual discipline, who have stability. They've been, they've been around a while. Uh, they've, they've been, they've been predictable, responsible, stable with what they've been doing thus far. And their faith is, their faith is firm, right? Because you've all met unstable people, people that you can't rely on, people that, that fly this way and that way, or who are tossed about by every wind of doctrine, as James says in his epistle. So we need to maintain that stability, that discipline, and that firm faith in Christ. And here comes another hard one. Mature believers are willing to serve in some way. Mature believers are willing to serve and suffer. And see, I think that's, that's the, also goes back to what we mean by emotional maturity. Are you willing to put up with some discomfort to get a better thing? Are you willing to wait? Are you willing to put off your own gratification? Are you willing to sacrifice on behalf of another? Are you willing to do the thing that you don't want to do because you know it needs to be done? Those are marks of maturity. Now, I do want to lift up one verse, that's actually our opening verse, um, opening verses, uh, 1, 24, 25. Now, Paul says, I, now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Again, there is its fullness. I gave you everything. I didn't hold anything back. Um, but, but this idea that Paul says, I suffered 
to make up for what is lacking in Christ's affliction. Now, wait, wait a minute. Is Paul trying to say that, you know, yes, Jesus suffered on the cross, and, and, and yes, he did a lot of suffering, uh, but, but, you know, that wasn't quite enough. Now, now, look, Christ suffered a lot, and we have to come along and suffer just a little bit more in order to be forgiven. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Christ's suffering was sufficient. There's that word again. It's going to be my favorite word for the next couple of months. Christ's suffering was sufficient once and for all, for all the sins of all humanity. Um, but, what, so what does Paul mean by this idea of suffering? Uh, that, that, that now, because Christ suffered once and for all the sufficient suffering for all sin, Paul's suffering and our suffering is going to have to do with the spread of the gospel. Paul is going to have to suffer in order to take the good news of Christ's suffering to the rest of the world. And so the same is true of us as a church. We're going to have to serve. We're going to have to suffer. We're going to have to sacrifice for the, the spread of the gospel throughout the world. J.D. Greer, quoting a Romanian pastor and leader, Joseph Tisson, said, Christ's cross was for propitiation, that's a fancy word for forgiveness. Ours, that is our cross, is for propagation, that's a fancy word for spreading. Christ suffered to accomplish salvation, we suffer to spread salvation. That's what he means. So we have to be willing to serve, we have to be willing to suffer. Not, not, because, not because Jesus needs our help, but because Others need Jesus. Mature believers, because of all this, because of our knowledge, because of our wisdom, because of our strength, our, our stability, our discipline, because of our service and suffering, mature believers have the hope of glory. Paul says, God has chosen me to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. What's the mystery? Christ in you. What is Christ? The hope of glory. Now, I, I, I need you to understand something about this word hope, and I say it all the time. In English, we misuse the word hope, and we do it all the time. Um, so, so, in other words, if I can say something that, well, um, this is true, but, but it's certainly something I do, I do hope. Um, I hope that it's cooler today than it was yesterday. Amen? I hope, I hope it's cooler today than it was yesterday. Uh, but I'm just using the word hope there because what, do I, what am I really doing? What is the verb I'm really doing in that sense? Not hoping, but wishing. See, we use the word hope as, as synonymous with the word wish. But in the Bible, the word hope does not mean to wish for something, it means to wait for something. In the Bible, the word hope does not mean to wish for something, it means to wait for something. It's something we know is going to happen that hasn't happened yet, particularly if that knowing involves faith. Right? If that knowing involves faith, then that's hope. And we have the hope of glory. We're sure. We're sure. Because we are believers in Jesus Christ, because we have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we are sure that we are going to experience eternal glory in heaven. And when we, when we keep that hope alive that's in us, that makes us mature. And so we are called. We are called to be people of wisdom and knowledge of the gospel. Knowing that, 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 that the Bible makes known to us everything there is to know. Everything that we need to know is there. And because we have that wisdom and that knowledge, we're not able to be deceived. No matter how fine sounding the arguments might be. Because we are mature, we are stable and disciplined, and we have a firm faith. Because we are mature, we serve and suffer. And because we are mature, we have the hope of glory. And 
And so, brothers and sisters, let us strive to be mature in Christ, in Christ alone. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for your continuing to work in us by your word and your Holy Spirit to make us more and more and more mature in Christ each and every day. God, continue to grow us, continue to build maturity in us, wisdom in us, knowledge in us, stability in us, discipline in us, and continue to build in us a spirit of service and suffering and sacrifice and continue to hold before us the hope of glory. God, we pray for this church. We pray that you bless us and help us to grow and prosper. Help us to worship and serve you in spirit and in truth and serve the world in your name. God, we pray for the whole body of Christ throughout the world. We pray for the persecuted church. We pray for the United Methodist Church. We pray for this annual conference and our Bishop Lord and her continued recovery and our interim Bishop Deb. We pray for this district, our superintendent does. We pray for our community, our nation, our world in these troubled times. We pray for all those that are sick, all those that are suffering. God, we pray especially today for Jim that people and for all those who are, are in need in our community. We pray for men and women who are serving us at home and abroad. We pray for our world leaders at every level. We pray for ourselves, our families, our church, our community, our nation, and the whole world, the blessings of peace, justice, health, safety, freedom, stability, prosperity, and holiness. And now, God, we pray that you hear the prayers of each and every heart, worshiping with us today, either here or at home, as we lift up our prayers to you, either silently or aloud, saying, in Jesus' name, Amen. God, you heard our prayers here this morning, and you hear the prayers that remain silent in our hearts. God, you know our every need, and we do not know how to pray. Your Spirit intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. And God, we pray that you hear us now as we lift up our voices together in the prayer which our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite you to stand and join me in professing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory of the Lord, 
Experiencing grace, exploring truth, expressing love. 